Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today let's start the proceedings with uh, considering the equilibrium thermodynamics as I said the goal for this is going to be to look at the adiabatic flame temperature we will talk about this adiabatic flame temperature in significant detail uh, as we go along but before we get to that point there is a few more things that we have to learn uh, so let us start with some assumptions the first assumption that we will make is that chemical reactions we are talking about are happening uh, in the gaseous state so occur between gases right this is something that we talked about previously where uh, we are basically looking at fast exothermic reactions and the speed the, the high speed at which these reactions are happening or the high reaction rates that are happening is primarily coming out of the fact that we are looking at gases that are reacting in for most part so this is this is not a bad assumption any time you make an assumption you have to justify the assumption okay so and you have to look at how broadly valid it is or where, where the uh, invalidity is or where the exceptions would be okay so this uh, this assumption here kind of precludes things like surface reactions or heterogeneous what is called what is meant by heterogeneous reactions is when the reactions are taking place uh, between molecules which are belonging to two different physical states okay uh, here we are looking at homogeneous reactions and uh, then we assume that gases uh, obey perfect gas laws this is also a fairly reasonable assumption uh, for most gases uh, uh, which are uh, the which we encounter and are uh, uh, typical temperature and pressure but then the question that arises is when you we know that uh, combustion is a high temperature situation uh, if not a high pressure situation so uh, maybe we are looking at atmospheric pressure or a few tens of bars or at the most a few hundreds of bars uh, but um, uh, we are not looking at thousands of bars unless you are looking at gun propellant kind of applications okay uh, so we are not looking at very high pressures uh, but temperatures are high so the question is is it okay at the moment let us let us say yes let us say we will just assume this for the sake of simplicity but it is possible to relax this assumption that is another thing that you have to examine when you are looking at assumptions you have to see is it possible to relax this assumption and make it make the analysis a little bit more complicated right. So from that point of view this would now qualify as what is called as a simplifying assumption so we are trying to simplify our analysis by making this assumption the third is uh, chemical processes uh, occur between equilibrium end states right so we are we are talking about a few things in this in this assumption first of all as I said the other day we are dealing with thermodynamics so thermodynamics is all about dealing with states and paths not necessarily how fast you are going from one state to the other state through a path number one number two you are always better off talking in terms of state properties and state variables as opposed to path variables so we will always look for those kinds of thermodynamic variables that are state variables rather than path variables. So, so that we can essentially look at a starting state and an ending state or state 1 and state 2 those kinds of things. The third that we are looking at here is 
we are now making the assumption the assumption about this is that these states are equilibrium states that means you started out with a state let us say in this case of reactants all right so you now started with a, with, a, with a couple of reactants which are in equilibrium that means they are, they are in a thermal and chemical equilibrium uh, with themselves and then you you let the process happen and let's say the reactions happen and you now get to the final state and when the when you get to the final state uh, you now get products right so the products are now at the let's say the adiabatic flame temperature or at an elevated temperature when compared to the initial state okay at that state at which the products are they are again at equilibrium that means they can equilibrate among themselves so that they, they will have interactions like collisions and energy exchange and all those things happening but they are all in equilibrium they are not disturbed out of their equilibrium state okay so that is exactly what we are uh, assuming over here and this is important because we are essentially looking at equilibrium combustion thermodynamics we are not looking at non equilibrium processes we are not looking at departure from uh, the, the equilibrium situation where we are looking at uh, the rate at which things are happening and so on okay no no rates uh, considered here okay. <coughs> so here if you now go back to this the perfect gas equation of state that will be applicable uh, for us is the notation that we will use is uh, PV uh, equal to RT where uh, V small v is the specific volume P it, it is understood that P is pressure uh, the small v here is specific volume later on we will reserve the the symbol for velocity when you are looking at flows but not now uh, this is the specific gas constant right and this is the temperature all right so the specific this is not the universal gas constant okay this is the specific gas constant when you are actually using a specific volume over here they do they go together make sure that you do not make a mistake on this when you now adopt this equation of state as the perfect gas equation of state then this implies that your internal energy will be only a function of temperature okay um, so the notation here is to say E equals E of T only simply means that uh, E is only a function of temperature and the enthalpy is only a function of temperature oops so this further means that you now have a a specific heat at constant volume d over dt um, this this means that uh, cv is a function of temperature only okay so we could go back and write h is a, h is a function of temperature only and uh, and uh, cp uh, is a function of so you you could write here uh, and CP equals dH over dt which implies uh, CP is a function of temperature only okay. So, so long as you have the CP and CV as functions of temperature only we call this thermally perfect. So, basically what it means is if you now assume the perfect gas equation of state it follows that your gases are thermally perfect okay in other words you can, if you ask the question what is so perfect about the, 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 the gas you can say thermally perfect it is just one and the same all right. So what you do normally do is usually usually uh, we express express uh, cv of t 
uh, and uh, C p of t uh, as uh, polynomials as uh, polynomials in temperature okay. So such polynomials are available for different chemical species in the literature. So this is sort of like something that you can for most analysis that you want to do treat it as given okay. So if you want to take a temperature dependence of the specific heats uh, for specific species uh, you, you, should, you should now treat it as given all right. Now so, so what, what happens like uh, so first of all the question that you have to ask is uh, uh, so why does the CP and CV vary with temperature in the first place right. So there, there are uh, quite, quite many reasons for that and uh, we will not go get into this you have to get into uh, physical gas dynamics for learning these things. So essentially you have the molecules can uh, translate and they get some energy out of heating uh, by, by virtue of having a certain temperature where as, as you elevate the temperature they start rotating and then vibrating and so on okay. Uh, but there are some uh, processes which will now cause a departure for these uh, molecule for, for these gases to uh, not just depend on temperature only but also one other thermodynamic property in which case we are now departing from the ideal gas situation all right or, or the thermal thermally perfect uh, situation right. Um, now so we can expect that as you increase the temperature uh, you are now uh, exciting some rotations and then the, the CP increases and then after some point all the molecules are rotating okay so that the CP does not really change for some time and then after some time you are beginning to significantly have vibrations and then the CP increases and so on. So it is possible for us to think that there could be ranges of temperature over which CP could be treated as constant that is it does not vary, does not vary with temperature right. So when uh, when for sufficiently small range of small range in temperature small range in temperature um, it may be acceptable to approximate okay it may be approximate um, the specific heats uh, as constants right this is what we would call uh, we have we have uh, what is called as calorically perfect calorically perfect gas okay. So a calorically perfect gas is like a subset of the thermally perfect gas. Okay, the thermally perfect gas is essentially the one that starts obeying the ideal gas equation of state but it does not really mean thermally calorically perfect gas all the time this is like a further assumption that, that we have to make right about, about uh, caloric perfection yeah all right. Now this is like a, 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 a prologue if you will uh, but the prologue is going to continue on with uh, some more thing. Let us now consider a general chemical reaction right and this chemical reaction that we consider would be of the form sigma i equals 1 to n let us say ni single prime script capital mi gives sigma i equals 1 to n ni double prime small ni double prime um, script capital mi okay we are talking about a chemical reaction here now what we are used to looking on high school is like let us say CH4 plus O2 gives CO2 plus H2O or um, something else like let us say I do not know I do not know. NaOH plus HCl gives NaCl plus H2O 
those kinds of things right and then we we look at the Mendeleev's uh, periodic table look at those symbols for these different uh, 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 elements and then we, we now form compounds based on those symbols and all that stuff this does not look anything like that and this is supposed to be a chemical reaction right. So how do we figure out that this is actually a chemical reaction yeah so the answer is this is the species right so script M stands for the chemical symbol of the species that you would use yeah and we are now looking at the ith species out of a capital N number of species keep in mind this capital N or the or, or the summation running from I from I going from 1 to N appears on both sides yeah so that means N being the total number of species okay so this is species I chemical symbol this is total number of species right so why would the total number of species appear on both sides why would then all the species appear on either side so it is sort of like saying NaOH plus HCl plus NaCl plus H2O gives NaOH plus HCl plus NaOH NaCl plus H2O right so you are putting everything on either side but in reality you are having only a couple of them here and a couple of others there sometimes you could have one of them there like let us say you have an excess reactant okay so let us say you have a uh, what is called a fuel lean situation okay uh, and we will, we will have to figure out what that means a little later. Um, so you will now, now have an oxygen excess so you can, you can now throw in oxygen on either side of your re reaction but not all of them that does not make sense but that is going to be taken care of by these. So if one of the species is going to be purely a reactant its coefficient n n i single prime is going to be non zero and its its coefficient n i double prime is going to be zero that means we now reckon that as a purely a reactant okay and and vice versa so if something is a purely a product this survives this becomes zero so you can essentially kind of um, construct a list of n i single primes and n i double primes look at which is all zero and then uh, figure out which is reactant and which is product okay. So this kind of like good for you to plug in, in into like a computer program yeah so you do not you do not necessarily have to distinguish between reactants and products. So in reality as well you now look at like very complicated combustors right so when you, when you now have the flow coming in uh, it is essentially reactants that are coming into the combustor you ignite and then you have a flame and you typically have some recirculation zones like you have like a bluff body or like a sudden expansion and so on and then you have products and the products actually recirculate in this recirculation zone okay and then feed back into the flame in fact the products are hot as we will try to find out the adiabatic flame temperature and these hot products are the ones that are actually recirculating back to the cold reactants and heating them up to actually get them to burn further and further right. So at any particular point in your combustion zone you will have everything you will have in general you will have the reactants you will have the products all of them together. So it is always good to treat all of them together simultaneously you are always looking at a mixture of reactants and products together all the time yeah. So that is the reason why we are always running this summation from I equals 1 to N through all species regardless of whether they are reactants or products okay. So this is this is something that you have to kind of get accustomed to you have to get used to and essentially what you have done is to sort of algebraize okay if I can gen up a word like that uh, chemistry so instead of actually writing chemical reactions we now write an algebraic equivalent of a chemical reaction so, the, so that it can go along with this okay. So with this then um, <coughs> we now look at what is a stoichiometric mixture. what is stoichiometric mixture stoichiometric 
is 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 uh, basically then denoting that particular combination of ni primes okay ni single primes okay that is what is the proportion of the reactants that you are going to take such that you will have all of them completely react into products with none of the reactants left over right. But how do I know what is meant by products I can take reactants all right I can get them to react all right and then I get something and how am I supposed to know that they are products what else can it be huh you just produce them right so what you produce is products huh? isn't it or are we missing something we are looking for stable products right so that means the reaction should be complete as it is in thermodynamics we do not really have a notion of how fast things are supposed to happen. So now you got a couple of reactants to get together and ignited and got the reaction going and then you wait and wait and wait and I got something how am I sure that I am not going to get something more right wait for some more time go for coffee come back and see what happens is that how it is does it how it works huh so how do we figure out is that like a metric we can, we can we can figure out that the reaction is complete now I got stable products and then I look at the products and if I do not find any of the reactants right then I figured that the combination of the reactants that I took was a stoichiometric mixture this is how I am going to say right so how do I decide that I got stable products right. So there we go so there is this some someone who is beginning to say we have to look at their energy states huh? we will get into quantum mechanics then right. So let us do it a little bit simply we do not want to get into the molecular level as much as we can okay we want to stick to a continuum framework in this uh, approach so but, but there are notions of energy okay so that is that is what we are we are now beginning to get into. So uh, a stoichiometric mixture. Uh, is a is a is a mix of reactants it does refer to the reactants that is the original set of reactants alone that you took up okay so if you if you are now taking methane and oxygen for example that particular proportion of methane and oxygen that will give you let us say carbon dioxide and water alone and no methane and no oxygen left over is what you are looking at okay but the question that I asked you is how do I know that I need to expect only carbon dioxide and water and nothing else could I have settled for carbon monoxide that is possible that is possible that is possible. So if I now can take like carbon methane and oxygen and allow for it to react and produce carbon monoxide maybe some carbon monoxide some carbon dioxide okay so now different combinations are possible. Yeah. So which proportion is supposed to be stoichiometric you see what I am saying I can, I can give you these kinds of exam problems huh? <laughs> so, so consider like carbon monoxide carbon dioxide and water or the, as, as the products now tell me what should be the proportion of carbon monoxide and sorry methane and oxygen that will give you a complete set of these products would that work for identifying a stoichiometric mixture so what is what is the catch is there a catch so what you are looking at is a stoichiometric mixture is a mix of reactants okay that is what I was beginning to identify that can in principle in principle this does not have to happen in reality there could be lots of barriers for the reaction to happen you put two, two things together they do not need to react for example in principle 
you, you can you can get aluminum to react with water but if you now try to put an aluminum kettle on this tau <laughs> okay and then pour some water in that to make a cup of tea you do not see an explosion there right you, you want to have some tasty tea <laughs> so that that is a reaction that is physically um, stopped okay so it, it, is, it is possible in principle but uh, does not happen in practice usually okay so in principle react to give products 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 with the highest negative heat of formation highest heat of highest negative heat of formation with nothing left over nothing left over is nothing none of the reactants left over right okay so we have now started throwing in some jargon in there we are now we are trying to say we are looking at products um, we are looking at products which, which which are specifically the ones with the highest negative heat of formation okay so you can say heats because these are products so so first we have to understand what is meant by heat of formation right One, and then we will be able to understand stoichiometric what, what the stoichiometric mixture is so note then in uh, the CHNO system when you now write something like CHNO what it means is we are now looking at a system with these as the atoms that are constituting the molecules in that system okay so these refer to the at atoms that are that are available um, so in the CHNO that is the carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen system uh, the products the products with the uh, with highest negative heats of formation are H2O and CO2 so that is the reason why I was expecting that if methane was getting oxidized I was I would look for carbon dioxide and water as the final stable products once I get them then I start looking at whether I have some more methane or oxygen left over if not I look at what is the proportion at which I took my oxygen and methane and then that proportion is the stoichiometric mixture okay. So now we know why we want to look for uh, water and carbon dioxide we still do not know what is meant by heats of formation yeah okay so <coughs> example H2 plus half O2 um, gives H2O that is reasonable right and uh, C plus O2 gives CO2 or stoichiometric stoichiometric if you have uh, H2 plus O2 gives uh, H2O plus half O2 or C plus 2O2 gives CO, CO2 plus O2 these are not stoichiometric right because we did not have this condition that nothing is left over we have some some of the reactants left over yeah in, the, in these cases okay and typically this is what are we are looking at um, and uh, this, this is what we would call as uh, these are are of uh, fuel lean stoichiometry okay so look at the jargon here stoichiometry is something that refers to any combination of, of, of 
uh, any combination of uh, the reactants in a mixture okay. So you can have a fuel lean stoichiometry or you can have a fuel rich stoichiometry or you have a stoichiometric stoichiometry. So what is stoichiometric is very specific but anything that is having excess oxygen to whatever extent is all fuel lean anything that is having excess fuel to whatever extent is all fuel rich okay. Now I would like you as you are talk as we speak um, of course I am not giving an example of where for example you can say, you can say let us suppose that you have a, um, a fuel rich situation then it is possible that you have excess carbon but you have a deficient oxygen you might actually get only partial oxidation of the carbon that is available and get into carbon monoxide all right and with no oxygen left over or no carbon left over that is not stoichiometric either because we are not looking at products with the highest negative heats of formation okay so that is something that I talked about. The other thing that uh, that is come out in, in what we are what we are uh, discussing here is something about notions of what is fuel and what is oxidizer okay. Now here we are we are we are uh, we are okay because we are, we are always looking at oxygen being there and whatever is not oxygen in the reactants must be the fuel is, is, is essentially our, our uh, brain wiring going on huh? but how when you now look at a reaction like A plus B gives C plus D <laughs> huh? how do you figure out which is the fuel huh? only then you can tell, tell, tell me whether, whether it is fuel lean or fuel rich so how do you know you have to look at electron exchange and all those things so again you have to get into the molecular level huh? can we do without that so he is talking about economics <laughs> okay air is something that is available for free in this planet for you to screw around with and, and uh, <laughs> okay and uh, keep contributing to global warming and that is for free you, you, can, you can do it with, uh, with uh, no penalty for yourself except for your future generations you know? but uh, fuel is something that you have to pay for now so you want to use it less <laughs> that is not quite true. Well, I'll come to that. So it's not quite true. Okay, for example, in rockets, okay, we have to provide both the fuel and oxidizer ourselves, and we choose usually to go for a fuel-rich composition. All right. So it's not completely true that you always have the deficient species as the fuel. Okay. Now we take the answer that uh, we have we have from back there. So the answer is, you look at the heats of formation. Right, so based on the heats of formation without looking at electrons and all those things we should be able to decide what is a fuel okay that is the purpose of this lecture okay so if you have to get there we first of all have to understand what is meant by heat of formation yeah okay so before we get into a heat of formation we first have to look at what is the heat of reaction right so the heat of reaction is heat liberated heat liberated when a reaction starts at some p and t and uh, ends at the same P and T how is that possible <laughs> or is it possible is it, is it possible for you to have a reaction that start at a certain pressure and then come back to the same pressure and temperature of course it is possible right so you can now take, take, a, uh, take, take a container and typically you know you can, you can have a container which is like a cylinder and then put a piston on the ah come on with thermodynamics we were missing <laughs> piston and cylinder all the while huh? <laughs> so they are coming back to, back, back to haunt us <laughs> so can't we do without piston and cylinders in thermodynamics we will do pretty soon huh? so but for, for, this, for, the, for the idea of conceiving what is what we are talking about let us say you now have a, a piston cylinder arrangement and then you now put in some reactants uh, into the cylinder you now throw in a weight on, to, on top of this piston okay which, which is acting in a um, 
time non varying gravitational field <laughs> okay and then you you know and then you, you have a certain pressure and temperature there and then you ignite and then get the reactions going okay obviously a lot of heat is liberated and the gases that are coming out are expanding and then the, it's now pushing the piston up let's say okay it is still acting at the same pressure because the piston has to balance the weight okay so the, 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 the piston being allowed to move up at a, with a constant weight on top is essentially ensuring that you have a constant pressure situation and any heat that is liberated that is going to heat up okay you now take it out you now put this in a water bath all right and then you take take it out and then get, get and then uh, you now get it back to the same temperature as before now you look at the heat that you now took out huh? and the work done do we have to worry about the work done what work done but that was to maintain the pressure constant the piston is massless but it is going to carry a weight on it on top of it <laughs> okay so the thing is the, the, the thing is we are now basically looking for getting the same pressure and temperature we try to maintain the pressure we get the temperature back by removing the heat that heat is what we are talking about okay so you still have this nagging doubt in your mind we had this expansion work right uh, is that to be counted or it is not supposed to be counted okay from this we are like no 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 whatever heat you are actually getting out by bringing the temperature back to its original position is what is the heat is what what you are talking about that means we are not talking about the expansion work okay. So keep this in mind you have an expansion work to account for or maybe it is already accounted or we have to bother about it so let us let us let us uh, uh, keep, keep that in mind okay there is something that is going on there okay. Now is it possible for us to talk about this without piston and cylinder okay so let us say for example you are like aerospace engineers and therefore we want to have engines and we want to crank up the engines and run them and all that stuff that is what we are here for what are we talking about piston cylinder sorry. So you are, we are basically looking at it in the map of thermodynamics right so we are looking at what is the pressure and temperature of the system when it was when it was in the form of reactants and what is it now when it has now become products. This could be happening for all we care inside a gas turbine engine and as a matter of fact most of these open systems like gas turbines and rockets and so on which have a nozzle or, or, or an exit they happen to maintain the pressure pretty much more or less. So they are all typically constant pressure systems fortunately for us. So we do not have to we do not have to have a piston and a weight on top of it and all those things gravitational field nothing right. So we have a constant pressure situation for most, most of the time okay the one is to capture the products and bring them back to the same temperature okay if we did that then we would not be flying this <laughs> engine right. So if, if you want to now figure out the heat you cannot be flying so uh, get back to the piston and cylinder that is good enough. Good. So now we talk about standard standard heat of reaction, right? Now this is the heat of reaction at some standard. Oops. Um, P and T so previously we did not fix what the pressure and temperature were we just simply said whatever we started out with we wanted to come back but now we fix that to be some standard okay and why would we want to do this is something that we want to keep looking forward to to understanding as we go along so we want to standardize some things here so we, we will now take for example most often but not always but not always um, standard P and T or uh, 
1 bar and uh, 298 Kelvin, 298 Kelvin right. Now 1 bar is like 10 to the 5 Pascals, Pascals is actually the SI units for pressure but uh, atmospheric pressure is approximately like 1.01325 uh, bars therefore we go in terms of bars instead of uh, uh, Pascals itself um, and 298 is pretty convenient okay. So it is like about 25 degrees Celsius which is uh, reasonably warm <laughs> okay so it is not unrealistic for let us say Indian conditions or uh, something. So this is a reasonably good standard for us to and this choice for all practical purposes of analysis that we want to do is arbitrary okay. So um, you do not you do not have to question can I change this uh, in your own planet yes <laughs> when you say standard that means everybody accepts something that is that's, that's what it is but it is it is an arbitrary choice okay. So now we come to heat of formation now the heat of formation is what we are really interested in okay we have been we have been beginning to talk about heat of formation when we talked about a stoichiometric mix, mixture and we also noticed that if you wanted to uh, recognize a particular component as a fuel the heat of formation is going to help us this is pretty important you know like for example let us say you become an astronaut and then you are sent to a new planet and then you are now beginning to dig up okay and then you are now getting something something new you have to know whether it is fuel or not isn't it so and you will start making a lot of money if you if you knew how to figure out what, what a fuel is huh? <laughs> so um, so heat of formation at some p and t some p and t is the negative heat of reaction negative by convention more than anything else uh, negative heat of reaction at that p and t for a compound uh, for a compound found from its I am going to use within quotes reference elements okay. We are beginning to get an idea of what the sentence means first of all we are talking about any species which could be a compound, compound is like basically bunch of molecules put together right and then we are looking at this being formed from its reference elements so elements are like the, the building blocks of the compound okay but we have something called the notion of what is called as a reference element so we have to see what that means um, and uh, I also want to point out uh, so this is uh, formed okay formed so uh, I also want to point out that this reaction as it is does not have to happen in reality okay you do not necessarily need a compound to be formed from its reference elements in reality this is a hypothetical idea of any compound that could be formed from its reference elements okay. So now we have to see what that means huh? so reference element means that uh, element as found uh, most commonly commonly in nature in nature when alone okay this is for every element so every for every element you have to look at what is the most natural state at which it would be found and that is what is called the reference element okay so still it is a little bit enigmatic so here example example O2 H2 N2 um, carbon within brackets S to denote solid okay solid and uh, when we say solid we are looking at graphite not diamond okay because if it were diamond that is most commonly found <laughs> It would, be, it would be very expensive right so graphite um, 
etc. For okay, now let's use words for 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 uh, for oxygen uh, oxygen hydrogen nitrogen uh, carbon etc. Respectively, okay, and and not. Okay, so every time we give an example, we also give a counter example, like what we did here. Huh? So, so we always know what is good and what is bad. <laughs> so, um, not is uh, uh, O H N, and uh, let's say carbon in gaseous form. You try to vaporize carbon, get it up to very high temperatures or something, uh, and then look at the carbon. That is not considered a reference element. We're looking at uh, carbon in, in a solid form for graphite and since we started out with the assumption that we are looking for reactants, rea reactions to happen between gases, gases is by default the state for most of the reactants that we are looking at. That means we are not going to say O2 within, within brackets G, H2 within brackets G and so on. So we are not going to specify if it is a gas. So it is only if it is a liquid or a solid we will use uh, parentheses like S and L and so on. Okay. So when you now have S in parenthesis that means it refers to a solid, if it is a L it refers to a liquid like for example you are looking at uh, Al2O3 that is uh, being formed in rockets, uh, it stays, stays in molten form as it comes out of the nozzle but as it goes through the nozzle it, the, the flow cools and therefore it solidifies so there is like a Al2O3 L that gives rise to Al2O3 S. Okay. So in there, we have, there we will specify L and S very specifically. <coughs> So this is what is meant by uh, reference reference elements. So the phase is indicated only for liquids and uh, solids, and not for gases, because gases are the default. Okay. So what is meant by so what what we have done here is to explain only the last couple of words in this in this sentence, right? So what is meant by uh, looking at a heat of formation? That means if you now look at H2 plus half O2 gives H2O, okay, uh, C solid uh, plus O2 gives CO2. These are formation reactions for uh, formation reactions for H2O, CO2 respectively. Right. So what else could not be an example? For if you now said H plus O gives, uh, so let's say two H plus O gives H two O, this is wrong. This is not a formation reaction. Okay. Not a formation reaction. So what about formation reactions for O itself? If, if O is not going to be like a reference element, okay, that could be formed because O2 should be the reference element. Therefore, we can say half O2 gives O is a formation reaction. We are always looking for one mole of what is being formed. So everything is normalized for the reactants correspondingly okay. Now if O2 is supposed to be the reference element what would be the reference element for it itself right. So O2 gives O2 is also a formation reaction that sounds silly does it. No, it says us, it tells it tells us something. If O2 has to react with itself to form O2, will it take any energy? No, right? So what do you expect for the heat of reaction? Zero. We will now assign a zero for the standard heat of reaction. We still haven't looked at what is standard heat of reaction. Keep in mind, we are looking at a heat of sorry heat of standard heat of formation okay so you're looking at a heat of reaction and a standard heat of reaction 
a formation reaction is a particular reaction so its rea heat is going to be the heat of formation and then we should be looking at a standard heat of formation. So we now arbitrarily assign a 0 for the standard heat of formation for reference elements because at standard state we now suppose that there is no change in the reference elements right. So standard heat of formation formation is is the heat of formation formation at some standard uh, p and t okay so could be the same as same as what we have noted there one bar uh, say one bar and 298k and uh, the notation for this is delta hf not 298 is the notation delta h stands for a enthalpy change okay and f stands for formation 298 is the temperature not refers to the standard temp standard pressure so this is the notation that we will use I'll pick up from here uh, in, the, in the next class and then point out to the question that's ha in our minds if you now have a constant pressure and temperature what happened to the um, the the expansion work okay so I'll see you uh, next class